third speaker is John Rees, who is going to uh, also a founder of Stop the War Coalition and a great writer on the, on many issues, including the rise of imperialism around the world. I, and he's going to give a sort of broader analysis, and then we'll go into questions and discussion. So, can you give a warm welcome to John Rees, please? Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, I think the reason why there is such, um, I would say, a, a public fear uh, beginning uh, about the crisis in Ukraine is uh, because people sense um, that there is something fundamental and important shifting in the world. And I think that that thing is this, that however dangerous and bloody the conflicts of the last 13 years have been, they have all had this characteristic. They have been wars carried out by the most powerful states in the world against states which are minnows by comparison. And by and large, the most powerful states in the world have allowed this to happen, even where they had reservations, as Russia had reservations or China had reservations about the Iraq war or the Afghan war. Um, they allowed the Americans uh, to lead a coalition of others, NATO countries, in those wars and the occupations that resulted from them. Now this conflict is something of a different order altogether. This conflict, as it's emerging, is not between the most powerful states in the world and entirely smaller and weaker states economically and militarily. It is the openings of a conflict between some of the most powerful and, as Carol says, nuclear armed states in the world. Now I agree with Carol when she says, I don't think that a, a military conflict is imminent in this, uh, in this situation, although it is not absolutely impossible. It may be the, situ it may be the case more probable, but perhaps still unlikely at this juncture, that a civil war emerges in the, in the Ukraine and that we have a kind of uh, even more hideous um, proxy intervention in that war than we have in Syria at the moment. But if neither of these two things happens, if there is neither direct military conflict or a proxy war, we should still be on our guard because this is the second now, uh, the second incident in um, a possible military conflict between Russia and the United States and its NATO uh, alliance, the first being uh, Georgia in 2000 and 2008. We are moving into a situation now where the conflict is not uh, between the Security Council members agreed willingly or unwillingly amongst themselves, but where the possibility, the foothills, if you like, have been reached of conflicts between the major states. And I think it's that sense which is pervading now the public fear about the developments that we see uh, that we see in the Ukraine. It's true, and I agree again with Carol here, that the economic ties are uh, are a break on those on those developments. But we should be aware that economic ties like this can be can be broken. Forty eight hours ago. Um, Russia and China jointly decided that they would no longer trade oil in petrodollars, that they would begin to, um, that they would begin to open up a new Silk Road um, uh, in uh, of a uh, trade of trade cooperation. Now, those of us who are located in the heartland of Western I imperialism uh, will understand that this is a breach in the global power the global economic structure um, which the United States and its allies dominated. But it is a more dangerous situation than what existed before because the economic conflict always in this system has a military component following not far behind it and the military conflicts always have an economic component following not far behind them. So the breakup of this system is a more dangerous world than the one that we left, even more dangerous than the one that we left behind, and that was dangerous, dangerous enough. Now the entire focus of analysis, of course, in the, in, the, in the Western media is on the microcosm of events as they've unfolded in the last few, in the last few weeks. Now, um, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan promised that, uh, that, uh, uh, that Carol and I would dwell on the hypocrisy of the Western leaders. Carol, for some reason, omitted omitted that. But uh, I'm not going to let the opportunity. I'm not going to let the opportunity pass. I'm sorry, but when you hear.
David Cameron and William Hague and John Kerry and Barack Obama saying you must not invade other people's countries. I'm sorry, but you know, I begin, I begin to stop listening to those people. Well, actually, I began to stop listening to those people quite some time ago. But even people who are still listening must at that point begin to think, I'm sorry, but you are the very last people on the face of the globe that should ever be allowed to utter those sentiments. And of course, what the, and what the hearers of those words, what the hearers of those words would understand to be the full depth of the hypocrisy of our leaders um, would be enhanced if they knew, and this is not at all in the mainstream media, it is not at all part of the uh, public debate, if they understood the process of NATO expansion as it's taken place since the end of the Cold War. Now, when James Baker, the then Secretary of State for Defense, met Mikhail Gorbachev at the point where Russian troops were being withdrawn from Eastern Germany, he said to Gorbachev, NATO will not expand, and I quote, by a single inch when you withdraw from uh, Eastern, Eastern Europe. But in the following 20 years, there has been nothing but expansion to the East. Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, the Balkan crisis happening at exactly the same time, at, at a point, incidentally, where even the American foreign policy wanted Yugoslavia to stay together, but Germany, recognizing Slovenia, broke up began the process of breaking up the Balkans, and the neocon analyst at the time said, we see the Balkans as a microcosm for the whole of Eastern Europe. And what happens now with the breakup of Yugoslavia can be seen by us as a model for what will happen to the whole of Eastern Europe and the project for surrounding, for surrounding Russia. And so it has taken place, not just Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic, but the states directly bordering, the Baltic states directly uh, bordering, bordering Russia. And by the way, for those who think that it's simply the case that the kind of last piece in this puzzle is NATO expansion and EU expansion towards the, the Ukraine, let me be clear, that is not the case. The NATO operations in the Ukraine do not date from the last few years. There have been a constant series of US Ukrainian military exercises on Ukrainian uh, territory over the whole of this, uh, of this period. So perhaps it would alter perceptions in, in, in the public realm if, for instance, there were a Newsnight story, I mean, I, I realise we're entering the realms of fantasy here, but bear, <laughs> bear, bear with me for a moment, if there were a Newsnight story, or if there were a mainstream BBC News story, which said, well, hang on a minute, wasn't it only last year that um, Operation Rapid Trident, which was a US-Ukrainian joint military operation in the Ukraine took place. Wasn't it the case that, um, and I, I recommend this website to you, and perhaps not all of you realize that the um, US Army in Europe has a website, but there is indeed a US <laughs> European Army website where they have a report of, um, of uh, Operation Rapid Trident um, and the negotiations between the head, the commanding general, Lieutenant General Donald M. Campbell Jr. of the United States who visited the Ukraine and had negotiations with Ukrainian Lieutenant Colonel Zenin who said that we have placed our troops under, you, under NATO and US command in order to better have joint operability. Now, here's the kicker. Operation Repent Trident is going to be repeated this July. So whether or not there are Russian troops in Ukraine, there will definitely be United States troops in the Ukraine this July, as there was last year, and not only last year, because Operation Repent Trident, uh, Rapid Trident, and its precursor, Operation Peace Shield, has been running since 1997. There have been 11 a series of 11 joint series of operations. Not only that, there is Operation, um, I, and I recommend here's another website you may want to visit, the, um, the Ministry of Defense of the Ukraine uh, <laughs> website, which helpfully lists in English for you all the joint operations with the Americans and other NATO countries since 1997. And you can see the, the small type here. There is one, two, three, 
four, five pages of such operations. There's one operation jointly with the, Ukra with, with the, Ukraine, the Ukrainians and the Polish forces that it takes place alternately every year, either in the Ukraine or in Britain. So let's be absolutely clear. The process of NATO expansion has directly affected the Ukraine and its forces. The land operations have been uh, coordinated with a similar operation at sea in the Crimea and in the, Black, uh, and in the Black Sea. So if we want to understand where the global dynamic of this is coming from, this needs to be part of the, this needs to be part of the picture. Now, as a matter of fact, even in these circumstances, even with a government which is full of oligarchs, even with a government which has got its uh, senior defence and interior ministry uh, portfolios held by fascists, and these people, by the way, make Western European fascists um, look like um, a, a wing of the liberal, uh, a wing of the liberal party. Even under those circumstances, I am in favour of Ukraine having the right to self-determination. But let's be clear. This will result, under these circumstances, on the Ukraine being pulled apart, and the people who will suffer from it are the Ukrainian people in the first instance. They will suffer, as we know, from the IMF deal. They will suffer from the response of the Gazprom riding, uh, rising, uh, increasing the gas prices. There is now a competition to replace Gazprom uh, on the part of Western companies to replace uh, on part of German companies to replace Gazprom's contracts. This is a society which is going to be dismembered by this, pro uh, by this process. And the people who drove NATO East, who drove the uh, European Union East, the people who run our government, the people who run the United States government, the senior figures in NATO and the EU are responsible for this process. They are responsible for the uh, danger which is now confronting us. They are responsible and they will use this not just to uh, diminish what Ukrainians can expect from their society, they will use it to diminish what we can expect from our society. Because the secrecy that involves uh, that is involved in the special relationship with the United States disfigures politics in this society. The constant following of the special relationship has dragged this country into bloody and expensive wars that it need never have participated in. The nuclear weapons treaty with the United States, if it were cancelled today, would build hospitals and schools in a time when we are told there is no money for hospitals and schools. So the secrecy the political alliance, the economic cost, the danger to the world are at the heart of our system. Now I hold no brief, we will be told, believe me, we will be told, because we've been told in every single uh, other uh, campaign that we've, uh, that we've involved, been involved in, that if we criticise our government, if we criticise the American government, we must therefore be friends of, let's list them, Saddam Hussein, the Taliban, Colonel Gaddafi, and no doubt now Vladimir Putin. Let me make this absolutely clear. Because I am opposed to my government, because I am a citizen of this country and I am politically active in this country and therefore I take on the government that is supposed to represent me, that does not mean that I hold a brief for any other government around the world. I hope that the protesters, and there was a massive peace uh, protest in Moscow, are highly successful. They have my solidarity. I've worked with them for many years. But my government is the government which drove NATO expansion. My government is the government that has a special relationship with the United States. My government is the government that had the record of the occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq. My government has a colonial history second to none, with more blood on its hands than practically any other country on the globe. So it will be here and now, and on behalf of people in this country, that we must wage our fight with our government. All the more so because NATO is coming to this country. In September, there is going to be the entire leadership of the NATO Alliance meeting in its special conference in Newport in Wales. We are calling for an absolutely massive demonstration of protest. We are calling on people from every corner of this country to get down outside this conference and say, you cost us too much. You cost us in blood. You cost us in treasure. You cost us in our civil liberties. It's time not that Britain backed NATO in being in the Eastern Europe. It's time that Britain got out of NATO and out of the crazy nuclear alliance of the British Republic.
to. Uh, yes, um, I just pass on to you a couple of uh, thoughts which aren't particularly mine. Actually, I just happened to, uh, in in my job as a journalist to interview. Um, somebody from King's College War Studies Department, which people may know is, is one of the kind of heartlands of, uh, well, it's the only college that has a War Studies Department, not a Peace Studies Department, let me put it that, let me put it that way, um, and a representative of the Syrian National Coalition. And they both made the connection. What they said is, um, it looks as if the Russians may step up arms to Assad um, in order to punish the Americans for the, for the Ukraine. And the guy from the Syrian National Coalition said, I hope that the West punishes the Russians in the Ukraine for their uh, stance on, on Syria. Now, uh, this, this may never happen. I mean, these are, these are tendential relations at the, at, at the moment. But what we do know is that when this begins to happen, when it's a conflict between major powers, the tentacles are everywhere. Believe me, for the very first time, the head of NATO is visiting an Egyptian government for the first time. Now, this is not out of the frame of reference of everything else that we've been that, that we've been talking about. On the EU, they have different configurations. You know, the strength of the of, of the EU is economic. It's uh, uh, as a, it has no unitary state mechanism and it has no armed forces. So obviously, it plays on its economic strength. NATO is a military alliance, so it's about the stick, not the not the carrot. There can be conflicts which emerge because of that, but the way I look at it, when it comes to the Ukraine, what the EU did is it knocked on the door and tried to bribe the guard, whereas what the NATO will do is kick the door in and take the stuff anyway. Um, the end process is basically moving in the, in the same direction, even if conflicts emerge, uh, emerge within it. Um, uh, what I've got to say about Rob's point is, well, you know, I agree, I'm, I'm opposed to anybody's imperialism anywhere as a matter of theory, and as a matter of theory, it's very important to understand how those imperialisms uh, conflict and what their interests are and how the different states compete with one another. As a matter of practical politics, I'm here in Britain, and I happen to be in the heartland of the biggest, nastiest, bloodiest imperialism ever, so that's where my concentrated political effort will be. important question and, and, and my answer to it is this you know there are many many situations and uh, and for the reasons that Jonathan outlined in his very first contribution about the kind of people that came into the into the square the question is this people begin to fight back for all sorts of reasons which are exactly the same as the kind of reasons why we don't like our government or we don't like austerity or we don't like attacks on the on the health service but they don't always get the political formations that they want, especially in revolutions. What happens in revolutions is a movement hits the old order and power falls into the street. And it isn't necessarily the people who made the revolution that picked the power up. And certainly in, in the Ukraine, the people who picked the power up are the people who are most opposed to the people who started the movement in the, in the first place. So the whole of politics for me is about this simple question, which you put very well. How do we form movements which represent what people really want to happen. And I would say one time we did this, in my experience, is we did it with this Stop the War Coalition. People didn't want the war in Afghanistan, they didn't want the war in Iraq, and they got a movement which stuck to those ideas. And that's why all the way through to the Syria vote, the majority of people in this country, in opinion poll after opinion poll, over 12 years, have said we don't like this government's foreign policy. And I believe the task now for ordinary people is to say the best way you can help an ordinary person in the Ukraine is to get David Cameron off their back, to get the United States military off their back, to get the oligarchs of the EU to stop helping out the oligarchs of Ukraine about doing down the people of the Ukraine. And we've got a job to do in that. Thank you, John. Yeah. Okay, just let me make a, a couple of points about, about that. I think it's quite right, as Carol says, you know, even if by some, uh, some magic we came up with a solution to the Ukrainian crisis in this room, quite frankly, it wouldn't matter very much because <laughs> our power to, 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 to pr transmit that thought um, or to make it a, a reality in the Ukraine is, well, next to zero. But there are some things that I would say about this which are uh, aimed at our own government. 
If I was seriously considering what lowering the tension in Ukraine might mean, if I was seriously thinking allowing a peaceful settlement to emerge among Ukrainians themselves, the very first thing I would say is that the Repent Trident military exercise, which the Ukrainian parliament voted through as soon as it got into power, and which is due to take place in July, should be cancelled now. The British government should say there is absolutely no time for British and American troops to be running around the Ukrainian countryside <laughs> in the midst of this, uh, of this crisis. That is stupidity on an absolutely enormous scale and it should be halted now. I think there should be a declaration that NATO will not, will not have a policy of encouraging the Ukraine to come in to NATO and will not carry out any more sea, air or land exercises with Ukrainian with Ukrainian forces. That seems to me absolutely elementary that in if that gesture were made, the room for negotiation, the room for discussion of a federal solution, not least perhaps, people said the, the, the ballot in the Crimea was rushed. Well there's no goddamn ballot in the Ukraine, this government isn't elected, and frankly, if there were a set of elections, it's hard to imagine that a worse government would actually be elected in the Ukraine. Now, all these things might happen, but they won't happen when there's this direct military threat. What do you think the head of the CIA was discussing in Kiev this week? He was discussing the military operation to go into the east of the Ukraine. That's what he was doing. He was militarily advising, I have absolutely no, no proof of this, but I would lay my life down on a bet on it that you do not get the head of the CIA going to, the, uh, to Kiev and five days later you have a military invention of the east of the country without that being a topic of, uh, of discussion. This stuff should stop because it's a driver of the conflict and has been for a very long period of time now. Um, I want to make a brief comment about the, what happens when there are divisions among the, imperial, uh, among the imperial powers. The way I look at this is if my enemy starts arguing amongst itself, good, but that doesn't make me love one bit or the other of the enemy. I remember very well, in Hyde Park, on that demonstration actually, on the Stop the War demonstration, when the French government um, was critical, do you remember? It was critical of the United States, that's where the whole, you know, surrender, what is it, the cheese-eating surrender monkeys came from. And I remember Ahmed Ben Bella, who was the leader of the Algerian resistance against the French. And I remember him standing on the stage in Hyde Park and saying, Vive la France! Now what he meant is, my enemies are divided. Believe me, the leader of the Algerian resistance did not mean, I love the French government. And that's my attitude to these things. If my enemies are divided, that's better for us. It doesn't make me love one or other of my enemies any of the, any of the better. And I think that's a sensible view of, these, uh, view of these things. Finally, I want to say this, that the person at the back said, what can, what can we do what, what, that we should all begin to resist? Absolutely, and there are many opportunities to do this. First of all, we have sustained the Stop the War Coalition practically uniquely over an incredibly long time. And sometimes that's necessary. I didn't think when we began this more than a decade ago that it would take until the Syria conflict to stop our government mounting an attack on another country. But we did. That, was the co that wasn't just one demonstration that did that. That was many, many demonstrations. And, uh, and the, and the um, whole experience of the war and the whole sinking of that into the minds of millions of people in this country that produced that uh, situation. The first time since 1782 that a British Prime Minister has gone to the House of Commons, asked for a vote for war and didn't get it. That was cumulative experience, cumulative campaigning. So sustain this organisation. If you aren't a member of it, become a member of it. If you don't give it money, give it money. If you don't sign the petitions, do sign the petitions. If you don't circulate the stuff on the media, if you aren't part of its activities, be part of its activities. Because this is an organisation that has sustained itself, that represents the majority opinion in this country, that has an effect, and now has got very serious more work, uh, more work to do. Join us on the demonstration. Talked about the NATO demonstration, but there's also the anti-austerity demonstration on the 21st of June. And believe me, the harder we hit this government on the question of austerity, the less room it's got for manoeuvre for its military adventures abroad. And the harder we hit it on the military adventures abroad, the less tolerance it'll have of austerity at home. These are linked issues. So join us on the 21st of the demonstration on the, on the streets, 21st of June on the streets in London. Join us in 
uh, Wales to oppose NATO. And I give my congratulations now to the councillors in the Labour Party and to the councillors in Plaid Cymru who said that Cardiff Council is going to officially back the demonstrations against NATO. Good for them. I wish more councillors. Uh, I wish more councillors. I wish more councillors too. So the final thing is. Um, as Steve Biko, the great anti-apartheid campaigner, once said, the most powerful weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. This argument has got to get these ideas out into the public, and from that we can build a movement which can break the logic that the warmongers have started in the Ukraine, but won't end in the Ukraine. John, thank you. Thank you.